Now, as I suggested last time, we're beginning an exploration of the theory behind our political and economic thought. And again, for those of you who are listening in at home on the radio, if you would like a syllabus for this course, you can obtain one by writing either to the Department of Integrated Liberal Studies, 228 North Charter Street, University of Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, 53706, or to the University of the Air, Vilas, WHA Radio, Vilas Communication Hall, University of Wisconsin, Madison, 53706. Now, we, as I said, we are on a long voyage which will take us from the thought of ancient times to the present day. And the purpose of it is to understand not only why we think the way we do, but the reasons behind the way we think the way we do. Last time we were talking a bit about practical reasoning in public affairs, and I said that a decision maker, someone in a position of public authority, doesn't just make decisions or make judgments, you also have to give reasons for them. A judge can't just pronounce sentence, he also has to give a decision, he has to write a decision giving the reasons for convicting or acquitting a person of a crime. A manager just can't close a plant. He or she has got to give a justification to the stockholders, to the community. An administrator can't just make a public decision. He or she also has to make judgments. And as we suggested, in giving reasons for one's decisions, there are really three kinds of reasons one can give, and only one really counts in the world of public affairs. Because you can give a, an explanation for your judgment or your opinion or your decision. And an explanation would be of the order, you know, if I ask you, if you're, you, know, you might say, I am supporting Ronald Reagan, and I ask why, and you say, well, gee, because I thought, you know, I was probably because I was raised a Republican, or I come from a conservative family. Now, that tells me, in a sense, why you believe as you do, but it's not a public reason, it's not a justification. Or we said you can give a motive as a reason. You might say, for example, that you vote you support Ronald Reagan because you're very ambitious and you want to be a success and make a lot of money and you think the Republicans are better for that than the Democrats. Now again, the fact that you want to do that explains, in a sense, why you decide or judge or have the opinions that you do. But it doesn't tell any of the rest of us why we should endorse them why your judgment might be good public policy, why it might be good as the com for the community as a whole. So the third thing, which is what we're looking for in this course, that you can offer when you make a decision, is a justification. And there your reasons have to refer to some values or some principles on, the, you know, on some public regarding grounds by which your decision is one that you would have shared by the community. And you are, in a sense, speaking to others and trying to persuade them that your judgment would also be in the public interest, that it would be good for the community as a whole. Now, as we go over the history of Western thought, in a sense, we're thinking about the explanation for why we think as we do. And as we study history, we're saying, oh, yes, we think as we do because Plato and Aristotle raised these questions, because we went through the Middle Ages, because society evolved this way. And we'll look a little at the motives of some of the people that were involved. We will ask, to some extent, why it is that great philosophers have always written in times of decline. And we'll look a little bit at some of the things that might have motivated the great figures and the great figure, uh, features or schools of thought and philosophy. But most importantly, we're looking at the justification. Why we different eras have believed that their ideas were right. And Particularly, we'll be looking for the justification of our own civilization. What philosophic, what historic, what foundational basis there is for the ideals of liberal democracy, the kind of economy we have, the kind of political order we have, the kind of morality that we have. Now, in a way then, this whole process of justification involves first placing your opinions upon the ground of some values. If you were asked, you know, why you are against discrimination, um, you might say, well, you believe in equal opportunity. You pronounce, pronounce a value. And you might go on to say that people should be judged only on the basis of their performance, 
not on such accidental characteristics that they can do nothing about, such as race or sex. But if you were asked to move a step further back and say not merely that, to, that you believe in equality, but to justify your values themselves, if I were to ask you the second question and say, well, why is equality a good thing? Or why should, you know, why should we treat each other equally? We're obviously unequal. Why should we use that as a standard of judgment in our public decisions? If we were to ask you that question, I think you'll see this in discussion sections when David and Alan push you a little bit on these things, you will begin to speak in philosophic terms. And one of the things you might do is develop a theory of human nature. You might talk about the essential character of all people in being able to reason or think through their own way of life or the fact that they ought to be free because people have the capacity to be free. And you'd be talking about the way people are. You'd be giving us facts to support your values, a theory of human nature. Or you might say simply that you know, your, your belief in equality is grounded in the belief that all people are equal in the eyes of God. And once again, you would be grounding your ideas in a statement about fact. God is a fact, the most important fact to you. And from that, you derive your conception of why equality is a value worth pursuing. Or you might give an answer that was based in simple reason. You might say, we're all ignorant. None of us have any idea about truth. None of us have any idea about what's right or wrong or good and bad, and therefore we're all equally fallible, and therefore we all have to treat each other as equals, which is a, an idea of pure reason. But in each of those three things, and you, you probably would do this if you were ever asked to justify your values, not just your opinions. See, so you, you justify your opinion in terms of a value, and you will justify your values in terms of a philosophy, and that philosophy will be rooted either in a statement of, about truth or in a statement about reason or about nature in some way. Now, this tells us a little about the close connection between science, religion, morality, politics, and economics that we're going to see running all through our exploration and our inquiry here. For we look for the foundations for our opinions and our beliefs and our political and economic values in philosophy, science, or religion. And it may seem odd in some way to put religion and science together in this way, but when you think about it, and as we shall see as, as we go along, both religion and science are really ways of theorizing about the ultimate order of the universe. To say that the will of God is the ultimate reality is very much the same thing as saying the laws of nature are the ultimate reality. It's a statement about what is final, what is true, what is everlasting, what is definite, what is unshakable. It's the sort of truth foundation of your belief. And you can believe in physics or you can believe in God. And either one, in a different way, is going to be an expression of that. To put it another way, a religion is a theory about God. And in that sense, it's a theory about nature, the nature of things, the nature of the universe. And science, in the same way, is a theory about the nature of the universe, the nature of the way things really and truly are. Now, that idea may seem a little hard to grasp now, but as soon as we get into Greek thought, you're going to see that that whole question and that whole idea, what is true, what is the ultimate reality, as the starting point for all thought, come into very, very sharp um, focus in your own minds. Well, from the theories of reason, science, and religion, from our philosophy, our conception of science, or our conception of religion, and I'm saying all three of these things because over the, the immense amount of time that we're studying we'll see that the mind of the West shifts from regarding the ultimate reality as based in religion, science, or philosophy, or it takes up all three at once, or it divides them, or it separates them. But these three themes, reason, science, religion, come in and out as the ultimate foundation of the theories that we'll be looking at as we go along. But from these theories of ultimate truth, these philosophies, we derive our theories of morality, our ideas of right, or wrong, right and wrong and good and bad. You know, we say, if God is this way, then this is good, this is right. Or we say, if the universe is an ecological system, 
then it is good to protect the, you know, to protect life on Earth, to try to sustain and preserve it. Um, we, in a sense, our ideas of morality come from our ideas of ultimate reality. And then, once we have the, well, along with this theory of morality, we have a theory of human nature. And in fact, I think we should put it the other way around, that first you have the theory of ultimate reality, then from this you derive a theory of human nature, what people are like, what the human race is like, what is distinctively characteristic of the human condition. And then from there you move from a theory of human morality. If man is this way, then um, how, sh how should we? How ought we to conduct ourselves? So if this is God, then this is man, then this is the way we should live our lives. Or if this is the way nature truly functions, then this is man's place in nature, and from this we can get an idea of what we ought to do. And from that notion of morality, of what we ought to do, we get an idea of politics and of economics. We derive our theories that way. Now the order, as we'll see, is not always the same. Uh, Aristotle, for example, thought that politics was prior to economics and ethics for reasons that we'll see, that politics create, for the simple reason, that politics creates ethics. Now, what do we do in politics? Well, one of the things we do is to deliberate how the society will define what is right and wrong, good and bad. When we make laws, that's effectively what we do. But I think for our purposes, the thing is to look for in any one of these total philosophies that we're studying is the image of reality, the image of ultimate truth, the conception of human nature, the conception of morality, and the conception of politics and economics. And all through the year, we'll be following the line of how Western man has deliberated how those, those things go together in creating a theory. Now, in the history of the West, there have been many, many different ways of creating such total theories, such philosophies. And one reason to study the problem historically is to discover the distinctiveness and the peculiarity of our own way of thinking about this thing and the vast range of answers that has been given to the kinds of questions, these fundamental questions, the questions that we're asking. And in understanding these total theories that we're going to be examining here, Three further elements to look for may help you to understand them. Now, every one of these total theories, somewhere along the line, has what I will call a creation myth. An answer to the question, how did things get started? How did the world get started? Um, every civilization tells itself a story. And here, I think, science and philosophy and literature come very close together. Because in a sense, all of science and all of religion are at one point have to tell a narrative. They have to tell a folk tale. They have to tell how things got started. Now the ancient Egyptians, for example, thought that the sun god created the world. And other religions have believed that in a sense the sun, cre you know, that the, the sun personified as a god was the source of all being and of all life. I mean, the American Indians, of course, in a slightly different spirit, did the same thing. The ancient uh, Hebrews in Genesis tell a very different story of how the world began. Now we look at these accounts today and we say, well, those are religious or those are myth. But then look carefully, and we distinguish those from science. But then look at the stories that science tells and ask yourself, are they really any different? Because if you ask a physicist how the world began, he's going to tell you a story. It's a story of a big bang, a colossal explosion of matter still receding into space. Now you may ask what happened before the big bang, and he'll say, that's not my department. But, it's the, uh, but, it's, but you know, there, it, there is a lot of evidence that, of course, that physicists have put together to show that this conjecture is a very interesting one. But it's like literature. It's a piece of art. It's, uh, let's suppose this happened this way. Or you can find in the literature of biology a notion of how life began. How life began in simple-celled organisms and develops and progresses into more complex organisms. Again, there's a lot of evidence that that actually happened. But when you think about how all the pieces fit together, it's a folk tale. It's our folk tale, but it's a very interesting one. And some of these become merely folk tales. 
For example, if you study an anthropology textbook, you'll find a point where the story depends upon the question of how, well, how the ape descended from the trees and became man, how man ceased to be an arboreal being and became a terrestrial being. And in the name of science, they tell stories of how this might have happened. And they're, they're charming stories. They're lovely stories of how you know, the first man decided to climb down the tree and begin to walk upon the earth and what that required. And this is done in the name of science. But if you examine them closely, they read just like the folk tales of a primitive society. Many of our scientific explanations have that mythic quality about them. And on the other hand, Many myths, of course, have a scientific quality about them. And they all have a literary quality to them, in a sense, um, that, that, that we're explaining how the world began. And none of us really knows. And so we're dealing always both with science and literature, with mythology, in any of the creation myths that we'll be dealing with this semester. We are always supposing, because modern man doesn't know any better than ancient man. We think differently about it. We have more evidence of a certain kind but perhaps it's no truer. The second kind of myth to look for in one of these complete philosophies when we get to the level of politics and economics and society is the foundation myth, the question of how the community began and how government began. The Jewish people, for example, speak of Moses as the great leader who covenants with God and leads the people out of Egypt. We Americans speak of the authors of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitutional Convention in setting our foundations. And it's funny, you know, we, we, we have a view of them that in the, in the perspective of the world is very strange, of our foundations. Because if I were to ask you, for example, to justify your belief in equality of opportunity, many of you would have said at the second level of analysis, not well, equality is a good thing because of some theory of human nature. You would have said, well, because it's in the Constitution. And if I were to ask you the third question, well, what's so terrific about the Constitution? I wonder what you would have said. And I think you would have said something like, well, there were these, what, they, you would have begun to tell a story. And you would have said, well, there were these very wise men who met in Philadelphia. And we have always believed this. And I wonder if you could quite get away from making a little bit of a myth out of it as you developed your justification for why the Constitution is a good thing and shouldn't be rewritten and, and so forth down the line. So our foundation myths aren't terribly different than the foundation myths that the ancient people will be speaking. And it's just worth observing how this hasn't really changed much in time. But they're terribly important. Because a foundation myth is part of a, an answer to a specific question of morality in politics and economics. It's a partial question to the question of why a political order is legitimate. We use that word quite a bit in this course. Legitimate is the political version of the word moral. It asks the question not why an individual's actions are right, but why a form of government is right and therefore ought to be obeyed voluntarily. So if, you were to ask, if I were to ask you the question, why do you obey the law? The first answer you might give me might be, well, you know, you go to jail if you don't. Uh, the second answer might be an elaborate description. Well, I believe in government of the people, and we share in the making of the law. And, and so you give me a theory of legitimacy. You tell me why you obey the law voluntarily on the ground that you accept the foundation myth, you accept the principles, you accept the philosophy of the society. Now, each society will have a different foundation myth, which helps to buttress its legitimacy, helps to give a reason to the people, a reason to society for why its government ought to be endorsed as rightful and proper. Now, the third thing, and this, is, this next one is, is fairly fascinating, because you don't always see it, but the moment you see it, it'll just pop right out of, at you. It's sort of like one of those gestalt patterns. The third thing to look for in any fundamental theory is the root metaphor. And what I mean by this is, you know, in almost all political theory, and in almost all theory of the world, you create understanding by analogy or metaphor by saying something is like something else. Now, in all of our theories, watch and see what politics is like or likened to. Now, for example, in our society, we often liken the political and econ order to a machine. 
You know, we talk of the political and economic system of the United States. And I've even, you know, you can see diagrams of it like a computer. You have inputs, that's public opinion, and then you have the computer, which is the government, and then there's outputs, which are public policy. Or you have the laws of supply and demand, as though there were sort of a great machine out there. Now, we think about our society that way. We talk about checks and balances and forces and you know, we have this image that our whole society operates sort of like a complex mechanism. As we'll see, by the way, as we go along, that's part of our heritage of Newtonian mechanics. We do quite intentionally think of systems in equilibrium, laws of supply and demand, checks and balances, forces that work themselves out. That's part of the scientific foundation on which our, our country was built because the United States came into existence at the time of Newtonian mechanics. We are not an Einsteinian, we are not a Darwinian country, we are very much a Newtonian country. And for that reason, we tend to think often of our politics and our economics as like a machine. If you think about it, you'll notice this. People get lost sometimes in the process. You don't think about people. You think about the political process. Wow, you know, a process. It's like processing corn or something. You know, something goes in one end and comes out the other. And we do have that metaphor built in. Or some people talk of the political order as a process of evolution, like biological evolution. Marxism, which as we shall see later on, was very much influenced by this train of thought, um, does see the whole world as a process of development, moving toward perfect communism, from capitalism to socialism to communism. Their root metaphor is that politics is like a process of evolution. Or one can argue, and this is part of our heritage too, that the social order is like a contract. It's a promise. Why do you obey the laws? Because we've agreed to. We have a social contract. We have made a bargain with ourselves. Um, the government is founded on an agreement in the same way as your decision to buy a car is founded on a promise or an agreement. Now, today we're going to briefly look at ancient history to understand how diverse such fundamental philosophies can be. And fundamentally, we're going to look, just take a glimpse, at the political theory of Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Israel to understand how different Greek thought is. Because what we're really doing, and we'll start this next week, is building up to ancient Greece, which is really where our civilization began. Uh, but we, to, to see why Greece is so different, we have to see what the alternative to it is. And the real alternative to it is um, the pre, what we might call the mythic civilizations of the ancient world. Now these three, um, ancient civilizations really dominated world culture in the world of the Eastern Mediterranean from long before Christ. I mean, we're dealing with the Egyptian dynasty, which we can date in its high form from about 4,000 BC to 1,200 BC. So the world we're beginning in is, let's say, roughly 2,000 BC. We're working up in time gradually for 1,000 years. And at that time, the center of civilization is in this part of in the area of the world of the Eastern Mediterranean. You have the Egyptian dynasty located in the river basin of the Nile, the Mesopotamian cultures centering eventually in Babylon along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers out in this region, and of course, um, ancient Israel uh, in the area where of course present day Israel is. At this point, Greece is an outpost of empire. It's a frontier society. And watch this carefully, because as you'll go through the course you'll often see, we'll often see that creativity comes out of the frontier societies, the societies that are the outpost of pre-existing empires. In a way, Israel is an outpost of Egypt and of Mesopotamia at the time when it enters its greatest creative uh, epoch. Now, when we say that Greece in, is distinctive, we say so because, in a way, the Greeks invented philosophy and science. And I suppose when we're talking about the distinction between the way the Greeks thought and the three great civilizations thought before, two points can be made. They're worth just making um, in a, as, as, we, as we look at this distinction. The first distinction between philosophical or scientific and mythic thought is that 
uh, mythical or philosophic or scientific thought thinks of the universe, thinks of ultimate reality in terms of abstract impersonal forces, laws of general motion, very abstract conditions and causes. Mythic thought thinks personally. It thinks of willing beings in the world. Um, of, of, it thinks of nature in personal terms rather than impersonal terms. Events are willed by the gods. Or natural phenomena have properties that are like people. They have a personality and desire. See, we think, we think philosophically or scientifically. And so when you ask the question, why does Lake Mendota rise and fall? You know, you will talk about meteorology. You'll talk about the rainfall patterns and so forth. But the ancient Egyptians, when asked the question, why does the Nile rise and fall, answered it, the Nile decides to rise and fall. And a lot of American Indian cultures would give you the same answer. Why does the sun rise? Because the sun decides to rise. Now we look at that and say, oh, yeah, that's just foolish. But that's their explanation. And it's a totally different view of the world. Instead of thinking that the only right explanation is to reduce anything in the world to something that's impersonal, abstract, um, logical, mythopoetic man thinks in terms of things that are personal. And for, for a mythopoetic person, a good explanation is one that shows the will, the character, the desires of the thing that is acting. The North American Indian says, the deer thinks so and so, the bear thinks so and so. The ancient Egyptians thought that the rivers, the sun, all had wills, all had personalities. So that their theory, their general explanation of the way the universe worked, hinged, hinged, in a long way, on the actions of the, of the gods, of the spirits, of that, very, of that universe that was thick with being, thick with personality, in a way that we can't even imagine. Now, the second great distinction between a philosophic society like Greece and a mythic culture is that a philosophic society thinks of the social order as a human-made construction. To ask questions like, what is justice? What is the good society? Um, how should we organize our economy? Implies that government and the economic order is a human contrivance, that it's made by people, that we have some choice in the matter. The social world is something that you decide about. It is not merely caused. Now, in fact, most people don't think like this, or haven't in the history of the world. Historically, most people have seen the order of society as given, as not subject to human design. It's always been there. It's traditional. It's historical. Uh, the Guatemalan peasants, for example, as, at least as far as we can know their minds, somehow see the rampages of their government as very similar to the rampages of nature. It's all one and the same thing. You have a tornado or an earthquake or a volcano blows up or you have a dictatorship. And it's all something outside of you. Now, if you think about that for a moment, though, you'll realize that you're not probably so very distant from the Guatemalan villagers or the people of mythic civilizations. You're not Greeks, because most modern Americans, especially students, do think of government as a fact of nature. You know, the government is there. You go to, in fact, this course may be surprising you a little bit because of the nature of questions that are asked here. You go to a social science course, and you're really interested in asking the question, how does government operate as a machine? Or you're asking, what are they doing to us? You know, would you ex please explain the forces of nature that causes Congress to behave in ways of that kind, or that, you know, that creates uh, corporations that do things of that kind? Please, Mr. Economist, could you tell me as you would explain to me how the forces of physics works, why you know, the, 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 you know, the Ford Corporation you know, goes off wacko from time to time in this peculiar way. We think of it almost as a natural phenomenon that needs explaining in natural terms. And in a way, we feel that it is not something that's changeable or susceptible to human will. Now, in that sense, we have a view that's more traditional, more like the ancients, than we do the Greek modern view that it's appropriate to think of government and this economic order as a human contrivance that we can do something about. Well, let's look at some of these, myth these mythic civilizations that contrast so much with Greece and just see briefly what their political theory, their philosophy looked, uh, looked like. 
And we'll just touch on them briefly because they're all very different, but just get a very general idea of how, how they, they, they saw things. It's well to begin with ancient Egypt, which of course was the, the greatest empire of the pre-modern pre age or the pre-Western age. As you know, it was a highly centralized monarchy you know, and a river kingdom. Um, it built great works, public engineering works, but most importantly, it was a highly centralized political system that dominated its region probably for longer than any government in the history of the world. As an intact regime, it lasted at least 4,000 years, and at the height of its power, when it was in its grand, it, even its grandeur itself lasted 2,800 years, very few regimes can make that statement. We consider the United States an old country because it has survived 200 years. Now, the Egyptians had an interesting view of the universe. They thought the universe was like a saucer, and the heavens were an inverted saucer, and it might have been held up by pillars. We're not quite sure. Um, in the east was the land of the sun's birth. In the west was the region of death. Um, the creation myth is interesting. As we've said, the sun, the sun god creates the universe, but is helped by two other gods, the air god and the moisture god, who give birth to the earth and the sky. So there's a little bit of an elaborate creation myth there. But note what happens. The world begins with an act of will. Something, see, it's not the Big Bang. It's not an impersonal force. Somebody decides to create the will, the world. And in this case, it's the sun god. Now, there, that's typical of a mythic explanation. There's a personal being that's operating there. Now, as the sun god creates the universe, and here we move from the theory of reality to the theory of politics and government. I won't take you through the theory of human nature because, frankly, we don't know that much about it. We, the, the, the sun god creates the universe, so the sun god creates the state. Government to the ancient Egyptian was a part of nature. It wills as the gods will. And the gods may be whimsical, they may be benevolent, they may be malevolent. Um, but so may rulers. You know, the, the gods may will earthquakes, the er gods may will good times or bad times, but so may the leaders of the state. Now, to put this another way, the Egyptians believed the world was made out of one substance, and they didn't really distinguish between gods, people, and inanimate objects. We do. Modern, even in our complex modern Judeo-Christian scientific community, we have three compartments, one for gods, one for scientific objects, and one for pe willing people. And they're, they're fairly distinct from one another. Now, you, know, you, you, you have a clear sense of what it is the difference between a subject and an object, in the sense that a subject is someone who can act, think, will, that you can interact with. An object is something like a table or a desk. And you make a very sharp distinction between these two categories of being. But the Egypt Egyptians didn't. To the Egyptians, things flowed together. So that if you can put yourself inside of their mind and just see for an instant how an Egyptian must have seen the world in which gods, willing creatures, and what you consider inanimate objects all kind of are mixed up together. They all have the same characteristics. So that the, the, the king is at once a willing person, but also a god, and also sort of a fixture, a part of nature. And on the other hand, the Nile River is a physical thing, but it has a personality and a will, and it's a kind of a god. And people, uh, you know, so that both people become objects, and, and objects become like people for the Egyptians in ways that we can barely understand. Now, what perplexes us, what follows from this is, is a view of nature in which all nature is pretty much the same. So, for example, in the royal tombs of Egypt, you could lay out food for the dead, because the dead had to eat like anybody else. But see, you could put out real bread, or you could put out a wooden, wooden image of bread, or you could just write the word bread on the wall, and theoretically it would all come out pretty much the same, because those things were, in a sense, interchangeable. The, the distinctions that we make were not the distinctions that the Egyptians had made. Now the king, the pharaoh, the son of the sun god, um, 
then becomes, in a sense, well, the, the legitimacy of the regime rests on the sense that politics derives from the order of the universe. You, you obey, you respect the king because he's part of what is true about the whole world. He is as inevitable as light and darkness. He is part of God's will. He, I mean, the king and the pharaoh and the ruler is just there. And one has a, well, I shouldn't even use the word duty yet, to obey him. One obeys him simply because he, he is there. Now notice the root metaphor in this. Politics is like nature. Politics is the same as nature. You can understand politics if you understand nature. The king, everything comes from the sun god, so does the pharaoh. Okay, now that's one model or one conception of ancient mythic civilization. Now, looking radically at a different one, we start thinking about Mesopotamia, which the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which started out anciently as a rather decentralized political order. A lot of city-states along these two rivers that eventually were unified under uh, Babylon and particularly under in the reign of Hammurabi, Hammurabi whose great legal um, order you are reading this week as well. Now, the interesting contrast between Mesopotamian thought and Egyptian thought is that they do it the other way around. For them, the universe is like a political order. Um, see, the, the Egyptians tried to explain politics through their view of nature, but you know, when, when you ask the Mesopotamian or Babylonian, what is the universe like, he starts giving you a political story. And what he says is, well, you have a lot of gods, and the sky god is the king, but there are a lot of different deities, and they have different functions. It begins to look like a corporation. I mean, one's in charge of agriculture, and one's in charge of this and that and the other thing. And um, each community has uh, the, the gods, and they, they meet in parliaments, and they meet in councils. And if you want to explain something that happens in the world, you talk about the manipulations in parliament. You talk about who's getting ahead, and who's in charge, and what the coalitions are, and what the parties are. Now that sounds odd, but you know other societies have had those myths too. Those of you will who will study Homeric Greece will realize that you have the same view of, the, of religion, the same view of the ultimate truth of, rea of, of, of the universe, are gods acting politically. The Homeric gods do the same thing. So do the Norse gods. And so there you have a whole group of societies in which you have this view of the universe as a parliament or council. Incidentally, if you want a terribly spooky theory, feeling, up to the present day, those societies that have had those pantheistic religions like Greece, Scandinavia, England, have been the ones that have developed democracy. Whereas those that have believed that, you know, in the other view that the gods are not like a parliament and council usually have dictatorships. Now, don't ask me to say too much about why that should be so after 2,500 years, but it's an astonishing way in which mythology correlates with modern politics. Um, in any event, from the view then of the universe and the explanation of the universe was cast in political terms for the Mesopotamians. Uh, all great cosmic events, then, were explained in terms of the deliberations among the gods. See, it's a very personal view again. We don't explain the forces of nature by impersonal laws, as we do scientifically. Now we explain them by who's getting ahead in parliament, which is a marvelous, charming thing among the gods. Now, the theory of man, then, and of the earthly kingdom, well, to understand man, to understand morality, to understand politics and economics was to understand the special relationship of the earthly kingdom to this heavenly kingdom. And the, the relationship was fundamentally one of obedience. Man had been created by the gods for their purposes. Hence, each city-state along the Tigris or Euphrates, each estate was seen as part of the property or the jurisdiction of a god. So you were the person of this god. And in a sense, that god was your landlord and your ruler and everything else. Then obedience was the duty of their people to their political superiors. But the political superiors on earth only acted in the name of the gods. 
Now, when Babylon and its king Hammurabi rose to a central position in the empire, it meant both in terms of scientific theory and religious theory and political theory that the city god of Babylon, Marduk, had been chosen to carry out the prime minister, he had chosen to be the prime minister of the assembly of God. And that was the myth that was told to explain the rise of Babylon. You see, at once it was a scientific theory, a religious theory, and a political theory in our terms. Now you may look at these two theories, that of ancient Egypt and that of Babylon, and say, this sounds like the priestly class was putting one over on the people. I mean, if you can talk people into believing that the gods derived from the sun, or that, you know, that they owe an obedi you know, obedience to the sun god, or something like that, obviously, you know, you've got a shell game going, and if you can make it last for 4,000 years, it's a mighty good one and a mighty profitable one. That's okay. You can look at it that way if you want to, that it was all sort of a sinister manipulation. But then what legitimacy myth is true? What does protect one? And it is true that we have inquired since about how one can be protected against myths that can be exploitative. But it doesn't mean that modern myths may not be in some ways any more or less exploitative than the ancient ones. And the other thing is we don't know what are they intended to exploit. I imagine most Egyptians and most Babylonians simply thought all of this was true. The same way, we will, way that we believe that a free enterprise economy somehow fits with the forces of economic nature, the true laws of economic, true in some sense because they are like physical laws. Ah. Now, let's turn to the third great society of this era, ancient Israel. And here you see something different because Israel is more modern. Israel is almost going to come and show a break with this mythic past. And it's a fascinating one. And it's also fascinating because in our civilization, we've preserved this mythic civilization, that of the Judeo-Christian heritage. And it's part of our living reality in a way that the experience of the other two are not. Now, it's all in the Bible, curiously enough, or as Jews would say, in the Torah. And usually we think of these documents as religious items, but today let's consider the Old Testament as political theory, as the kind of theory we've been talking about. Most of the Old Testament, in fact, was written between 900 and 630 BC. Now, this is much younger than either Egypt or Mesopotamia, it's the development of their high civilizations, and we're almost verging on the classic age of Greece, incidentally. Athens is beginning to form out of the Ionic Age in this period. So uh, you know, what you have here is a relationship where Israel is reaching self-consciousness about two or three or four hundred years, we don't know precisely when, ahead of Greece. But something is beginning to roll in the Near East, and times are changing. Now, in that period, from 900 to 630, most of the books of the Bible, uh, of the first five books the, uh, of the Bible, many of the, of the prophetic writings were, in fact, uh, put down. And uh, these were, many of them, old myths, legends committed to writing, and codified to create a total theory of a people. Now, the political theory of Israel, of course, includes a creation myth in Genesis, a foundation myth in Moses' covenant with God, and an elaborate discussion in the prophetic writings in Deuteronomy of morality and a political economic law order and a system of laws. In two ways, though, Hebrew thought was daring and original and modern compared to that of Egypt and Mesopotamia. First, of course, was the idea of monotheism, that there is one God and there is a clear difference here, as there isn't in the other two civilizations, between the creator and creation. See, creator and creation are all mixed together in Egypt and Mesopotamia. You've got the gods are you know, running around and they're causing events on earth. But in Hebrew thought for the first time, there is a divine creative force and a material universe that once set in motion kind of has laws of its own. God intervenes. But the material universe is apart from God now. And so you, in, in Hebrew thought, you get the first inklings of what will become scientific thought in the sense that the material universe is to be explained on its own terms and not as it were the will of God is seen in every natural occurrence. 
Now, secondly, what's important about ancient Israel is that you have a theory of politics in which man plays a creative role. In both, Meth both Mesopotamia and Egypt, man is purely passive before the force of nature or the gods. But notice what happens in the Hebrew story. Man covenants with God. Man makes a bargain with God. God chooses the Hebrew people, but they also choose him. The root metaphor of this society is contract. There is a bargain between man and God. And so man can choose to disobey God. Man can choose to be with God. And this is something that you, know, you just couldn't even understand in Egyptian or Mesopotamian terms. Now, the political order of, the, of ancient uh, Israel follows from the order of nature. God is an active present force in history. He is the ruler of Israel. He calls forth kings, but they rule only by the will of God. Until David, the basic idea of all Hebrew thought was that the king was in effect sent by God. Not, you didn't rule by consent of the people, you were chosen of God. The books of Judges illustrate this kind of political theory. And then we come to the writings of the prophets, also of about the same period. Micah, Isaiah, Amos, and Hosea. And it builds on these themes. Usually what we see in these writings is a call for the Jewish people to mend their ways and return to faith in God. Israel's political decline is due to a betrayal of the covenant. Over and over again, the people break their side of the bargain. Those are the standards. Those are the principles. The principle is the covenant. When you break your side of the bargain, God, though he's loving and forgiving, is going to wreak havoc on Israel. Things will not go well. The nation will not hold together until something, until Israel returns to the ways of God. So you have your principles, the principle of the bargain. The bargain is broken, then it is time for the leaders to come forth and guide people back to adherence to the law of God, which will sustain the land. Now, Hebrew thought in this way seems, you know, man begins to play a creative role. You have the inklings of the idea of a universe in which material things are separate from the mythic tradition. So in effect, we have two sources of the Western tradition two sources of the break with the mythic past, Greece and Israel. Both mark the beginning of a politics of human responsibility, where the subject of what should be done becomes a question of human thought and analysis. Now, when we say that the Greeks invented democracy, which is what we will say, the significance of the point becomes clear. We think of democracy as rule by the people, and we oppose it to rule by a king or an elite. But in the context of the ancient world, what rule by the people really meant was something that was opposed to rule by the gods. Because you're still living in a universe where man does not perceive himself yet as capable of judging, creating politics for himself on his own terms. But once, and once Greece discovers that question, it's exciting, it's exuberance, and it leads to an enormous and creative age. But there is still an open question, what is the nature of the universe? What is the beginning point? What is true about the order of the world and what is the meaning of those facts for the order of human affairs? And these, as we shall see, in trying to make consistent man's conception of nature and man's conception of human purpose, we begin a long conversation that really doesn't begin in Greece at all. It has its origins as far back as we can trace it into ancient history. 